Today we're going to look at the relationship between average thresholds or litmus items and category frequencies. Here's the scenario we're going to use. It's a simple little experiment. We're going to imagine that out of the, all the people who could have taken our rating scale instrument, we have a thousand high performers whose logic measure is two, a thousand middle performers whose logic measure is zero, and a thousand low performers whose logic measure is minus two. Now those thousand high performers, we'd expect them to be at two on, or roundabout on the rating scale, but of course under the Rush probabilistic model, some of them will actually be observed to give a rating of one and some of zero. Similarly, the middle performers, we expect them to be give ratings of one, but some will give a rating of two and some of zero, and the low performers, generally around zero, but some will give a rating of one and some will give a rating of two. This is why Rush is so good for that type of probabilistic data in which we're not quite sure what people are going to do. So here's what the probability curves look like for data that fit the Raj model with the people a thousand at minus two, a thousand at zero, and a thousand at two. And as we look up the column of red arrows, which sum to 947, it says of those 2,000 people, uh, roughly uh, 700, uh, actually of the people at minus two responded zero. They were added to by the people, uh, some of the people at zero who also responded zero, and even some of the people at plus two logits lo responded zero, and all those zeros put together add to 947. In the center, the number of people who, who responded one is 1107, and at the top end, the people who responded to is 947, and uh, that comes to approximately 3,000 people with some rounding errors. So that's where we are. Now, on we go. That's the picture as we expect it to be. The orange vertical lines are marking the locations of the Andridge thresholds where adjacent categories are equally probable. Now in this picture, the Andridge thresholds have come a little closer together and the counts of people in the central category observed in the central category. After all, the number of people hasn't changed at all, but the number of people observed to give a one has dropped from 1100 to 700. And then, when we go again, now, the Andridge thresholds are now at zero, in fact, and you can see that the number of people observed to give a one is now 568, and the width of the Andridge threshold is, in fact, zero, and there are 1260 observations in the high and low category. If we advance yet again, now, the Andridge thresholds are reversed, they are what's called disordered thresholds. The number of observations in the central category has dropped yet again, now down to 382, and in the other two categories has increased. Now notice that the number of people at each point on the latent variable has not changed. All that's changed is the width of the central category, which we could say is the discrimination of the central category or how big it is on the latent variable. There's nothing about category disordering or anything like that going on here. We're just making the central category wider or narrower. So now, let's summarize this information, and what we see here is how the Andridge thresholds relate to the count of observations in the middle category in our example. So when the Andridge thresholds are far apart, Nearly everybody is responding, that's the left-hand end of the graph, nearly everybody is responding in the central category. It's almost 3,000 people. When the category 
Uh, Andrew's thresholds uh, have zero difference. That's in the center of the graph. The Andrew's thresholds go from ordered to disordered, and the number of observations in the central category drops. But notice it drops smoothly. There isn't any sudden change in the uh, behavior of the instrument. The disordered Andrews thresholds may be a problem for inference, but they're not a problem mathematically. We can contrast these thresholds with, in the next slide, the Rush Thurston thresholds. And here we see what happens. The Rush Thurston thresholds and the Andrews thresholds track together just down the left hand end, but then the Thurston thresholds never disorder, and as the count in the central category goes to zero, their gap goes to zero. For those not familiar with the Rush Thurston thresholds, there, where the sum of the probabilities of the categories below the threshold equals the sum above the threshold, as opposed to the Andrews thresholds, which is strictly for the category above and below its threshold. So what we're pointing out here is that the process of category frequencies against and Andrews thresholds is smooth and doesn't depend on any change in the nature of the categories. It just depends on the category frequencies. Thanks.